Welcome to episode five of Spotlight Sessions, the podcast from AMP Talent Group, bringing you conversations with some of the most interesting and accomplished people in the entertainment industry. I'm your host, Rosie Ferguson, and today we're so excited to have Stephanie Gorin on the show. Stephanie is one of the most sought after casting directors in the business with over 25 years of experience. She's cast for some of the biggest TV shows, feature films, and theater productions, including, and this is just to name a few, Reacher, It, Aladdin, Come From Away, Kinky Boots, Dear Evan Hansen. Her work has earned her multiple awards, including an Emmy for Best Casting of a Miniseries for Fargo. Stephanie is an incredible resource for actors looking to succeed in auditions, and we are so delighted to have her on the show today. Welcome, Stephanie. (laughs) Thank you for having me. And that was quite an intro. I'll pay you later. (laughs) (laughs) No need, no need for that. Let's start with a question that's on the mind of every actor eager to impress casting directors like yourself. What is it that you're looking for from an actor during an audition, during the casting process? I think the thing you're looking for most is to see that an actor is connected to the material. They've taken the time to think about it and they understand what the character is and, you know, that it rings true. For sure. And when you're seeing an actor during an audition, do you see common mistakes that they might make that, what advice would you give them to maybe help them avoid these pitfalls? (laughs) Well, there's a lot of common mistakes. It depends, you know, if you're just starting or if you've been around for a long time. I I think that the important thing is to focus on the work and remember that you've been invited to that. It's like being invited to the party. You've got a chance to audition. Um, If you're doing it nowadays, a lot of them are, if uh, the theater is starting to be in person, I've just finished doing that for for quite a while here Mm. in the last month. But TV and film tends to be on camera. And so the the good thing about that, you may think, oh, is uh, I don't get to be in the room with the person. But the good news is, is you could do that 10 times and then just send your best one or two takes, depending on what they've asked for. And I think that's an important thing. The other thing is, is if you are taping is to make sure that you hold your if you're using a device, hold it horizontally versus vertically, because if it's vertical, what happens is we get these tapes in and we have about one third of the screen is you right. and, and the other two thirds of black lines on either side. Not good. And, in, <laughs> and no, <laughs> uh, frame yourself. Well, generally it's head and shoulders. Cause that's what we want to see. If you shoot too far away, we can't really see your reactions. And what we are seeing is what the producers and directors will see. It's actually no different because often producers and directors wouldn't be in the room because they're busy writing, they're scouting, they're in another country. And so we would send our tapes on to them. So what we're doing is watching everything. And then, then we will choose the number of people they might, if there's 10 great ones, 10, 10 will go to the producer and director. If there's only five, we might only send over only five, that sort of thing. Be careful. Your background is plain. When I was doing casting here, just in my office, uh, we just threw up a blue sheet okay. up on the wall, you know, just uh, tacked it up on the wall. And it's just, pl- it's a nice plain background, not like the background I'm using right now. Um, so that it's, it's, um, we can just focus on you Got it. and not what's happening all around you. I think that that's an important thing. And don't wear anything too busy. You okay. don't have to costume, but if you are going for an office, you know, manager type person or a lawyer or an agent like an fbi agent it's nice to wear a jacket it's nice to have your hair look clean you know that the facial hair is clean if it's better not to have facial hair but if you have it you know make sure it's cleaned up because there are rules in the fbi and the cops about how much they're allowed to have and if it's a simple you know if it's like a housewife or the lady next door whatever just something simple not overly patterned and be careful with stripes and things like that about um, props, Stephanie, sometimes you'll see insides, there'll be, you know, perhaps, you know, you're holding a phone and that's easy. We all have phones. But mm-hmm. what if it, it's a prop that, you know, you might not necessarily have in the house? Should you try to acquire that? Should you just try to to approximate no. it? <laughs> Don't do it. Okay. Period. Okay. okay. So I know that's a question <laughs> people, actors ask a lot. Like, should I, should no, I have this? Like, I does it matter? It's funny. Somebody told me a story um, about a week ago about someone coming in with a lawnmower because they thought it would make it. It's a funny story. <laughs> like an actual lawnmower. That's amazing. It was a, it was a gardening scene. <laughs> uh, and I have had people come in with knives and fake guns and things. I don't like any of that. It's okay. not necessary. Okay. And also we're shooting, we're shooting above 
that area usually. Usually we're tighter than that. We don't need to see it. You know, if you're a, st- a stunt person and you need to show something, you know, like you're holding a, you know, a, a stick or a quarter staff or something, you need to, you're not actually allowed to ask for that on camera. But okay. let's suppose you're someone who's super physical and you want to show that. I would do a clean one without all that in and then do one showing some physicality or just doing a, a little, t- send in a tape of anything physical that you've done. So generally, props no i can't stand it when somebody's chewing gum through an entire scene right it's very very distracting yes you know um or if they're if it says the character's smoking i think it's okay if you do that you know a couple of times within the scene but it shouldn't be all about that it should be about about the acting and what you're trying to put across for sure and you know you mentioned now that you know we're doing self-tapes the advantage is, yes, you get to do it 10 times until you're happy with it and send it in. But what advice would you give to actors that, when, you know, when you go into the casting room for, for an audition, it's there's that energy and, and you have that adrenaline. And sometimes taping a self-tape at home by yourself, you might lose that, that energy. And maybe you're going to do it 10 times, maybe you're going to do it 20 times. When do you just stop? And and what should you prioritize in terms of, of lighting and audio, that kind of thing? Like how how particular are casting directors like yourself looking at how good the audio is or how good the lighting is? The audio is quite fine on. I've, I've cast many, many people for big roles, small roles, all sorts of roles who've taped on a phone or with a okay. simple camera at home. You don't need to have an, a special overhead mic. You do not need to have a clip-on mic or anything like that. You just have to be sure that we can hear the sound, that you you know, you know don't have a dog barking in the right. same room as you're auditioning, that kind of thing. Um, as, as long as we can hear it, you can hear it, we can understand it. That's all we need. In terms of lighting, yeah, you, you don't need to have a special light, but you need to have enough light so that we can see you. Okay. It shouldn't be too dark. And if, I mean, and if the weather's decent, you can even shoot outside. It doesn't matter where you shoot. I mean, okay. you know, we're really watching up, you know, from head and shoulders up generally. Okay. Okay. And, and I'm not sure if I answered all of your questions because there that, that was a multiple choice in there. Yeah. Well, and the first part, the first part of it, thank you. The The yeah. first part of it was, was that, that energy. Oh, the energy. And, you know, how many times should you, like, should you do it 10 times or should you really just do it a, a couple of times? Like how... How do you sort of, of, of psych yourself up in that way that is, is a little bit missing from when you're in a casting room? Um, the energy, the, the, you know, when you talk about energy, it's a different kind of energy for TV and film. You know, when you're going in and you need that energy for a theater audition, you need it. Um, to TV and film, it's not the same kind of energy. It's really just becoming, thinking about the character and being connected to that character. And that's what's important. How many times you do it? Sometimes you can get it in one. And you right. might do a second one just because you want to see how it looks. And sometimes you're not really connecting to the character. And so basically you're using the camera as a rehearsal. For for in terms of connecting to the, the character, do you feel that actors should make that effort to be off book for for an audition or would that be more when you get to the callback phase? How do you feel about that? A lot of people are booking just directly from their tape. There haven't been as many callbacks I found unless it's a really large role or there might be a tie between three people and then they'll call them back to try different things, you know, but generally they'll just book from the tape. And so it's whether or not you're off book, I think that's you know, we can't require you to be off book, but the more comfortable you are with the material, the more that you're engaged and the more connected you are to that material, I find, you know, uh, uh, if you have your pages on, you're doing an office scene, there's plenty of ways. I mean, you could be sitting even, you know, you might have a computer that's, that's near you or off to the side, your pages could be there. You know, when we speak to someone, we don't always speak directly into a camera and I wouldn't play directly to camera anyway. Okay. I play slightly off yep. and hopefully you have someone who can read with you. Yep. And then you may have, uh, you know, you may have another person in the scene and your pages are going to be on that side. So as long as they're out of frame, there's no reason not, not to have them if you need them. But I would try to learn the top and the end of it if you can. Okay. It makes for a stronger start and finish. Absolutely. And you, you mentioned readers. How important is it for your reader to be good? You know, like obviously, you know, they, they're reading 
does it matter if your reader is, is, is an actor or if it's, you know, just your partner at home that you've dragged into the room to <laughs> record yet another audition with you? What, 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 how important is that? I've had plenty, I've listened to plenty of tapes with readers, especially during the beginning of the pandemic, where it was, you know, the eight-year-old the son at home or the grandma or the grandfather or someone who barely spoke English. And sure. uh, and and as long as you can stay with it, it, it can be distracting, yeah. I have to say. You okay. have to be careful, whoever you've got reading, that they don't need to be bigger than you are. They, they, they're they just trying to keep the flow of it. So even if they're not reading it correctly as an actor, as good as an actor would would read it, as long as it's got some flow to it, just have them practice it a few times and, and making sure that they don't leave long pauses and they don't overact within the scene to give you more <laughs> to do. Like I listened to one yesterday where the person, and this was a very good actor, and the person reading with the actor was screaming their way through because it was a fight, and that's not necessary. <laughs> so and that would I, be distracting. Would be very, sure. it, yeah, it would, you do not want your reader to be distracting, for sure. Okay. It's about you. Of course. It's not about them. They're just there to help you. So we're, we've, we've talked about the audition and, and taping. Let's go back a bit and talk about preparing for an audition. So, you know, we've got our resumes, our demo reels, headshots. What role does all that play in the casting process? And maybe can you share some tips for actors who are, you know, working on their resumes, their, their demo reels, their, their headshots? How, how important is all of that and how can actors improve those elements? Oh, you have a triple barrel question. It's okay. <laughs> photos. Okay, yeah, let's break it down. The let's photos. start with photos. With okay, let's start with photos. <laughs> the photo should just look like you. Okay. That's all we need. Okay. We don't need a big glam shot I, uh, because half the time, you know, you'll get these photos that are glam or it's somebody with their arm up leaning against a wall or, <laughs> or their arms crossed like this or whatever. It's just, just, you know, with sort of mid chest up or head and shoulders and, and just look like you a nice, pleasant shot. Okay. So, we, you know, and the eyes should be, should be alive, not overly made up. Natural is much better in, in nowadays. That's what people are looking for. Sure. They're looking for more natural. So that's that. In terms of the resume, if you really haven't done anything, it's important to put, you know, your skills or what sort of training you're doing. Okay. People are always looking, what's your training? need to know if you drive, need to know your height. You don't put your age on if you're over 18. Okay. It's nice to know um, eye color and hair color because sometimes you're matching to people. You know, that's a nice thing to know. Um, Especially if you're someone who changes their hair color a lot, that you you still need to have it on there. (laughs) You can put red, sometimes blonde. Uh, Any special skills you have because sometimes we're looking for people who skateboard or people who dance or sing or whatever that may be. So I, if, if it's a person who doesn't have much on their resume, I will look at those things. And particularly, I'll look at any training or what they're doing ongo- ongoing to improve themselves because I, I can see then they're more serious. And when it comes to um, your demo reel, if you haven't done enough to put together a demo reel, what, what would you recommend there? Would, would you recommend perhaps some, some work you've done at an acting class or is it better to not have one at all? What, what do you think about that? I would look at something from an acting class, but I really don't need more than 30 seconds of that. It's just to see who the person is. And, and if you, in terms of a demo reel, uh, even short clips are fine. You know, if you've only got one clip, that's good. Use it. If you're in something where the person opposite you isn't good, I wouldn't use it. Okay. Um, because it's going to be distracting and it also shows that it wasn't a good production. Got it. So that's the thing. It has to be about about you. And um, if you're starting out, quite often people don't have demos anyway. Okay. Okay. And if you have booked a, a few things and, and, and they're and they're decent. How long in total should a demo reel be? You know, I've heard two minutes. I've heard, you know, it could be three or four minutes. Really, should it just be about two minutes? Um, it, it just, again, it depends on the material. Okay. I think that three minutes tends to be a good length. But I do know some of the actors have been around for a very long time. Their demos may be five minutes long. I don't think a producer is going to look for was going to spend five minutes, period, generally, you know, unless only the demo is being presented because they're a high profile actor. 
Okay. In which case, they're probably off on set right now and not listening to this. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but it really doesn't need to be five minutes. It needs to be good. It needs to be good. You're, you're... It just needs to, it could be one minute long if it's two good clips that really show you off and really, you know, let us get to know you and, and your skill as an actor. Okay. That's, that's all we need. That's enough to see. Now you, so you've got the audition, you're, you're ready to you know, perform for in, in front of a casting director. Now you mentioned that these days everyone is booking from the self tape. Um, but if you are in the, in the, in the process where you are getting a call back, how do you advise actors when they're receiving feedback or if they're getting redirection from the casting director in an audition during that process, what advice would you give actors into turning that advice into better perform into a better performance? I think it's just the same as if you work with an acting teacher, you just listen to what the producer, the director, the casting director is advising you because they've read all the scripts or the script if it's a film and they know what they're looking for. And they might help you with the tone or what you're not quite doing right with it. Okay. And and you just have to listen, listen, try to take it in. If you're not positive what they mean, ask the question for clarification. Don't ask a question just for the sake of it. Just ask it because you aren't really sure what the, or, or just to be sure that you know what they're asking for. I think that that's an important thing to do. Um, sometimes it's a tonal thing, and that's yeah. another, uh, just skipping to prepping for auditions, yeah. period. There are a lot of shows in Toronto now that have been going on for years, and it always surprises me when someone's going to audition, and they don't do a good audition because they haven't done the research. If you don't have Paramount+, Plus, you don't have Amazon, you don't have Netflix, whatever you know that particular show may be on, you can always find clips online, and you want to know what the tone of the show is. Because of the tone of the show, it makes a difference. You know, how you act a scene. That's a really good point. And it seems like such a, a basic thing. Just, you know, watch watch the shows, see what it feels like to have it reflect. But is that probably, maybe that's something I think we all need to be reminded reminded of. Yeah, yeah. Because, you you know, you suddenly get an audition, you go, oh, no, no, no. You know, I don't have time. I have to learn this. And, and, and really, just a clip, there'll be clips online, even just finding a, a clip just to know, okay, what is it? Is it a, you know, an action drama? Is it a drama with a bit of humor? Is it more of a sci-fi? Is it a hallmark, which tends to be more smiley? <laughs> Happy moments. Happy and sad moments. So you know where you're going there. Um, I think it's it's good. It's 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 That's a good way to educate yourself and, and learn a lot from that. For sure. And then in terms of, of working on your s skills so that when you do get an audition, whether it's it's in the room or, or you're taping it, what do you see with actors that you think that they should be working on more? Is it is it is it voice? Do you wish people were taking more acting classes? Is there anything that you think everyone should be working on a little bit more? I wouldn't ever use that as a general statement because many actors really do know what they're doing. And it's hard. It's become more and more competitive out there as as um, this world has uh, grown in Canada. And many people know there are a lot of shows out there and you can make a living. And so, you know, what it used to be I might have 100 people suggested for a part that's got, you know, six to eight lines. Let's say it's a small principle. Sure. Now, uh, I if it's a female, I could have 450 people suggested. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there, you know, so you, you got to up your game. Yep. So you need to be, make sure that you, you know, that you are trained and, and, you know, keep your chops up. A lot of people who are, unless you're on set a lot, if you're on set a lot, that's training in your, in itself, because you're working with directors, producers, and, you know, really high caliber actors. But if you're not getting on set a lot, then I would try different classes. You know, okay. it's good to work with different teachers because the light's Suddenly you go, oh, I never thought of that. Or something will make the lights go on that one person explains to you differently than another. Absolutely. So before we wrap things up today, I'd really love to tap into your expertise to address a, a common challenge I think that many actors face. And, you know, in light of what you said about things being even you know more competitive than, than ever, Coping with rejection and, of course, all those negative feelings of discouragement that comes with 
you know, hearing no, and of course, a, an aspiring actor will hear no many, many times. What advice would you offer to actors who are perhaps in need of some uplifting guidance? Oh, you know, it's really tough. <laughs> <laughs> it's 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 tough. I was an actor first, way back, you know, yep. and it's it's hard. And you, especially if you find out you get down to the last two and you didn't get it, you know, and it's dash, it, you know, it's just devastating at first. You have to learn to get over that and find other things in your life that also make you happy. Um, I think that the good thing nowadays, which was different, you know, when I was performing when I was very young, is. You can now make your own content as well. So if you love to act, get together with friends, create something, shoot it. You know, even if you don't end up doing anything with it, um, shoot it, have fun and and watch the performances and how can you make them better and that kind of thing. And there's a lot of small film festivals out there that you can submit to. You know, you might not get into South by Southwest or Cannes or something, (laughs) but there's plenty of the small ones like, you know, small web series or shorts and things like that. So, and, and I think that that's a good thing as well. Um, it's, it, it doesn't make it any better when you hear, you know, uh, that, that somebody's down on their luck when you're down on their luck, your luck, because it's about you. Everybody has these things that happen to them and, and plenty of actors, whether they're extremely experienced or whether they're not experienced, have rejection, and it's part of this business, unfortunately. I mean, if you're in the States, you're competing against thousands versus hundreds here. So uh, you've got to do it because you love it and you enjoy it. You know, that, that it's something that you just feel you want to do, but have some other things in your life that also keep you grounded and happy. That is very good advice. Stephanie, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us. We know how busy you are, and we yeah. greatly, greatly appreciate it. <laughs> You're very welcome. And thanks to you for tuning into this episode of Spotlight Sessions. Looking forward to having you join us on our next episode, where we dive even further into the audition process and how to make sure you are maximizing each audition opportunity. I'm Rosie Ferguson. Thanks for spending time with us today. Bye for now. Bye.